This is the podcast of the Nova Center on Business, Human Rights and the Environment. Welcome. Welcome to the new episode on the Nova Center on Business and Human Rights and the Environment. My name is Luis Prate Castro, and I will be the research associate conducting this month's interview with Dr. Martin Smeltma and Dr. Daniel Schronfelder. Martin Smeltma is a partner of Pels Rixgen and a member of the Dutch Supreme Court since 1997. He has been involved in several international uh, landmark cases, which the Dutch Supreme Court and business and human rights cases. He is also a professor at the Erasmus University of Rotterdam, and he is one of the founders of the Erasmus Law and Business Sustainable Business Research Group. He has also advised the Dutch State Department on legislative options regarding corporate sustainability and regularly advises uh, public supervisors. Then we will be passing to Daniel. Daniel Schronfelder is a German lawyer and a lecturer in business and human rights and works at an international logistic firm on the implementation of the German Supply Chain Due Diligence Act. He has also a uh, previous experience involved working with political and civil society actors in the creation of the German Supply Chains Due Diligence Act. He is also the European Legal Advisor at the Responsible Contracting Project, where he coordinates the German team for the project to develop the European module contractual clauses. With the, the development of the human right and environmental due diligence laws, the contractual module clauses have been seen as a solution to uphold human rights and environmental due diligence issues. The module contractual clauses are obligations, the contractual obligations that can be included in supply contracts for the manufacturing and the sale of goods. Here we discuss the concrete European module contractual clauses and how they have a potential to uh, impact the supply agreements. Now we will be restarting with the, the questions. What are the main gaps in the current contracting practices in relation to human rights and environmental due diligence issues in supply chain agreements? Well, the first thing is the problem that some contractual approaches to this are um, essentially creating legal fiction that is sending the wrong incentives and is overburdening suppliers. Contracts are important for human rights and environmental due diligence because they clearly communicate what you expect of your suppliers and make these expectations enforceable and say who has which role and which responsibility. However, we see several problems with current uh, contractual practice. First one is that often suppliers are required to sign guarantees of no risk and no violations. This is a problem because um, if suppliers sign these kinds of declarations, they are mostly lying because human rights risks and violations are prevalent in many, many supply chains and operations in many firms. For example, in my home country, in Germany, equal pay is reached in only very few firms or discrimination because of racism uh, is also widespread in society. So this means that almost every German firm has human rights risks or violations happening. So if you sign a contract that says it is not the case, you are basically signing a lie and then you have to hide the lie to not be punished because these contracts foresee termination rights or contractual penalties. We believe that it is better to oblige the parties to human rights and environmental due diligence, um, which is a mix of obligations of means and obligations of results, but basically, essentially, an obligation of means to do your best to minimize risks and when violations happen, to end them. The other thing is that um, most contracts are one-sided, only put contractual obligations on the supplier side and leave the buyer free of additional obligations. This is a problem because, essentially because of responsible purchasing practices. So sustainability costs money. And as the OECD guidance from 2018 already point out, the purchasing behavior of the buyer determines the capacity of the supplier to uphold human rights. 
if they get very low prices, they cannot pay workers decent wages is the easiest example. So in this situation, we believe it's important to also have obligations for the buyer in the contract, obligations that the supplier then can rely on. It's okay to do responsible purchasing without putting it in your contracts, but it's a lot more effective if you put this commitment in your contract because then your supplier has the security to plan and he can say, okay, we know we now have a long-term contract. Our supplier, our buyer is really giving us the means to um, uphold sustainability so we can plan and invest in it. We can, for example, go to our bank also and tell them, look, we have a long-term uh, contract which includes responsible purchasing. So give us a credit so that we can invest in organizational health and safety, for example. But I guess Martin also has very interesting points to add on all of this. Well, thank you, uh, Daniel. But I think you already explained a lot and I think very, very good uh, insights in terms of, of why the contractual purchasing practices are not very working very well these days, especially, well, at least the, the, the kind of more traditional ones. Uh, and they, I think we have to realize that while the traditional approaches in supply chains is built on representations and warranties, and that was especially done to kind of maintain quality control in supply chains. But of course, the big difference between quality control of goods and the business human rights and environmental issues we are discussing today is that, well, usually quality is easily well, more easily observable from goods than um, for example child labor or forced labor issues so the traditional approach uh, was kind of transposed to also try to kind of implement some uh, business human due diligence business human rights or environmental strategies in the contractual supply chains but of course because this difference and of course, already the, the causes uh, Daniel alluded to, this is not working very well. And these contractual approaches may be even counterproductive in terms of trying to um, realize um, better human rights workers or environmental practices. And another thing is, which Daniel already also alluded to, the problem of the termination rights, because usually, well, companies or buyers try to shift the risk to the supplier and say, okay, well, your responsibility. And if things go wrong, as Daniel Ross said, well, then we'll terminate. And well, we'll go to another uh, supplier. And so kind of, well, you have to take care of it basically. And well, if it goes wrong, we terminate. And that kind of approaches will make suppliers very keen on trying to hide all kinds of problems because every problem may cause a risk of termination being not paid. Uh, so true collaboration, really some, some real attempts to implement things are kind of well not very real, realistic in that kind of situations. And what you usually see, but because of course the buyers also undertake some audits and try to kind of well assess what was happening with the, with the supplier but of course well in, in, in many cases uh, then they see a well, nice factory where everything is in order but those are probably only two floors of a factory which is well apart from that well not so very well kind of able to kind of all well, implement that kind of strategies or they use subcontractors or informal economies so there's a lot of well ways to kind of deceive the buyer and, and also kind of circumvene these kind of audit kind of things. So the basic point is kind of that focus on risk shifting default in connection with business human or human rights, environmental issues is not a very good approach. So that's why also the model contractual clauses we will discuss in a moment, try to depart from this default if an impact occurs strategy and try to kind of implement a more collaborative strategy. So the environmental or human rights impact as such will not always cause a default, usually not, but it triggers, if it cannot be addressed immediately, a kind of obligation to implement a remediation plan. And of course, if you don't collaborate with the implementation of the remediation plan, then of course that become, can become an event of default. But the idea is the impact as such is not a problem. But you have to do something about it, and that has to be a kind of more collaborative approach. Another thing is, which is very important, I think, in, in supply chains, that we well, get, as, as a buyer then, get enough information on what's happening. But on the other hand, well, today buyers are 
kind of asking for a host of information from the suppliers. They have to provide like every month a detailed kind of report on everything happening in terms of human rights, environmental issues in their factories. And especially if these suppliers are smaller companies, that may be a huge burden. So they are sometimes even overburdened by all these, inf especially if you have like 20 uh, buyers who all want to have and, and then all in different kind of formats uh, information on, on the situation in, in, in the factory. And on the other hand, buyers often do not get the information they really want in terms of what's actually now happening in terms of adverse impacts. So I think we have to be much more specific on the type of information we need we have to see to it that the information requests are proportional also in terms of the size of the um, supplier and kind of indeed provide the information we need so that's also a thing where the where, where we have to look at in contracts and finally the victims or the rights holders as such well if the impact occurs well usually parties focus on who has the risk, who has the problem, but not so much on the remedy for the uh, rights holders. And that is another thing where the collaboration is really needed and not a discussion on, well, did I contribute or not, but kind of enabling and assisting in, in providing that, that remedy, thinking of well, what kind of solutions are helpful or not. And I think that focus has to shift from who has the problem to we have to provide a remedy to the to the rights holders. And that I think is a, a big thing uh, to date also. So there are some things to improve, to be sure. And I will stop here for, for this point. Thank you so much, Martin and Daniel. Um, I think we can move on to the second question. Martin, why is there a need for European module contractual clauses to uphold the human rights and environmental standards in global supply chains? Yeah, thank you for your question. I think that's also a, a very relevant one because what we usually see if we start, and I think Daniel probably has the same experience, if we start talking to lawyers within companies in terms of well, their contractual strategies, contractual practices, and what should be in a contract, we usually see that they are very much used to the kind of well, risk shifting methods uh, we have just discussed. And of course, these are not just invented by them. Uh, they have kind of developed those strategies over the last 20, 30 years in supply chain and supply chain management. So they feel that that is a kind of right way of doing things in supply chains. And what we now basically ask them is to kind of well, completely well, leave that kind of depart from that kind of well, contractual practices and do things very different from what they are used to. And of course, if you tell that to a lawyer, they be, start feeling very uncertain if there is not any kind of example which shows how that should be done. And so the European model clauses try to provide that kind of guidance. And we also hope uh, eventually that also European Commission, the European Parliament will kind of support this endeavor saying, okay, well, these are kind of contractual practices we want to see. Public supervisors, uh, hopefully, in, in the member states are going to support it. And then, well, it becomes clear for lawyers, okay, well, this is a thing we can safely implement because it's apparently approved by all kind of relevant institutions. So we, we may use that. It also helps in terms of trying to implement more kind of comparable approaches in supply chains, because what we now often see is that suppliers are, are kind of confronted with very diverging contractual practices, clauses and the like. And well, if more buyers start to use this kind of model clauses, well, that also creates a level playing, playing field between the buyers, but also in connection with what the suppliers may expect. And that may also well, incentivize uptake by suppliers, because if everybody asking for the same thing, well, then it's easier to do than when everybody asks something different. So there, I think it's also important. And that, well, we feel that we also aim at developing clauses which are, are also practicable and can be effectively implemented by business so, so that they also well, see that that works. And finally, the model clauses may also develop some trust in, in well, that kind of contracting and also in, in terms of uptake, uh, where well, these model clauses are supported, are become a kind of usage, usage in trade in terms of, well, that's the kind of thing you should do. Well, then I think it, it well, becomes easier for lawyers to also convince others within their company, for example, to, to use it. But I'm afraid we have to do some capacity building still, uh, because many lawyers are still very much used to the well, kind of more old-fashioned way of doing things. And so well, we'll probably will see some 
kind of reluctance in terms of the implementation of, of the model clause at first, because well, it's completely different from what they are used to. I want to add maybe one point on that. What we This is a whole new world we are entering. I mean, business and human rights experts with a lot of experience like Martin would say, no, it is 2011. We had uh, the global compact for years and so on. But for many others, unfortunately, it's a brave new world still. And they need guidance for this. Lawyers are right now in Germany, large scale consulting firms on this. And they have good legal expertise, but they are not often not business human rights experts yet. And that's normal. And also, I want to highlight the model clauses kind of can be also an educative resource in the sense that I'm not saying that we have the perfect solution, but it's kind of our attempt to translate the BHR expertise that there is in the UNGPs, in the OECD guidance, and so on, and the practical experience into something concrete that lawyers can use, which of course, will have to be improved also over time. Our EMCs, I'm sure of that. But it's kind of our offer to help lawyers navigate this complex new requirements. Thank you so much to both. How do the European module contractual clauses relate to the 2023 OECD guidelines for responsible business conduct and the United Nations guiding principles on business and human rights? I can start on that. First, uh, there's a very good blog post on this uh, by the Nova blog. Maybe it can be linked in the notes of this episode that lays out all the details. Basically, the OECD guidance already uh, since 2018 and already since 2011 talked about uh, these topics. Not as concrete as we are now talking about them, but they establish principles like not simply uh, transferring obligations, also protecting the capacity by a responsible purchasing of the supplier to be able to fulfill human rights and environmental obligations. So our principles, our ideas are very much in line with that, what the OECD guidelines and guidance require. They are also recognized in the guidances and the guidelines as an important tool, contracts and purchasing practices. So you can kind of see the relationship between the OECD guidelines, guidance, and our contracts as we are concretizing some of their principles and making them implementable directly in contracts. Yeah, and maybe to add to that in, in connection with the UNGPs, uh, of course, there, well, the kind of same expectations exist as under the OECD guidelines. So, well, also, well, we tr also try to kind of have a look at these UNGPs in terms of the, the model clauses. And Although the clauses, of course, are built on the OECD guidelines in the UNGPs, of course, we know that the CSDDD at some points diverges from these frameworks. And of course, well, there we have to kind of find a middle ground between, of course, also being CSDDD compliant and on the other hand, trying to, well, as good as possible, implement the OECD guidelines and the UNGPs. So there, it's a little bit of a well, kind of mixed thing, but eventually we try to well, stay as close as possible to the OECD uh, guidelines and, and the UNGP. So, so the contractual clauses we propose really kind of reflect that kind of, of thinking. It's compliant with CSDDD, but also tries to implement the kind of thinking behind the rationale of the OEG, o, UNGPs and OECD guidelines. Thank you so much. Is the Netherlands human rights and environmental due diligence law proposal aligned with the module contractual clauses? Yeah, I think so, because the the well the, the Dutch law well, is still an initiative from the parliament. And of course, we, as you may know, have just had elections. Well, there's quite a kind of severe change in, in the political landscape. So it's questionable uh, whether well this initiative will will pass but at least the, well, the initiative kind of even broader than the CSDDD tries to implement the OECD guidelines and as the EMCs are also very well aligned with the OECD guidelines I think that they match very well I think with with the, the Dutch initiative but I said yeah it's it's kind of uncertain whether it will be adopted but of course when the CSDDD will be adopted well of course that has to be transposed into Dutch law so it may be that part of that law will still be used to kind of transpose the CSDDD. For example, there are all kind of uh, provisions on public supervision. Well, that may kind of easily also be implemented in a 
law, which transposes the CSDD. So it may also be very relevant in the Netherlands in terms of either complying with the initiative or maybe kind of law implementing the uh, CSDD. Thank you so much again. Now moving on, what does the CS3D say about the contractual clauses? Well, I think the proposal has uh, some language on contractual clauses. And the interesting thing is, if we look at it, kind of implements all steps of the OECD due diligence, though not in all uh, value chains, but but at least well, the idea is to kind of implement the six steps of the OECD due diligence. But the interesting thing is that we see a mention of contractual clauses especially in connection with step three, which is trying to prevent, seize, or mitigate adverse impact. Because article seven, which is about prevention of impact eight, about uh, kind of addressing impact are kind of well, connected to, to that step. Um, but we see a more general article in, in article 12 of the directive, which says that the European Commission can provide guidance on model contractual clauses. And well, the way we expect that to go is that the commission will probably kind of point out elements they want to see in, in their guidance, point out elements they want to see in contracts. And we hope that those are the important elements we present in the EMCs and then provide or kind of refer to certain examples, which they see as well, good examples in, for example, supply chains or kind of financial contracts or whatever. And we may hope that our clauses can will be mentioned as an, a kind of example of what's happening. But in terms of well, the ideas we have, part of it is already also implemented in the directive, and, and especially in Article 7 and 8, where we see, for example, support for smaller companies paying, for example, audits to date are often paid for by the um, suppliers. Uh, and now it says, and, or the provisions state, that if the supplier is a smaller, small or medium-sized company, well, then the buyer has to pay for these audits, for example. So there are some, and, and also in terms of responsible exit, uh, the, the kind of current strategies to immediately terminate after an impact, well, those are also addressed. So there are some language there in terms of um, after contractual clauses. And, and I think they also reflect the idea that it's not simply passing risk uh, to the supplier, but, but you have to do more. Yeah, maybe um, to add a bit on that, it is still the negotiations. No, So um, you can see that some different views in the um, official proposals by European Commission, European Parliament and European Council. And the European Parliament is very much aligned with what we propose in their wording proposals for Article 7 and 8 at the same time and also on responsible purchasing, which is kind of responsible Purchasing is kind of the other side of the coin, really, of responsible contracting. I always say that um, the one cannot re really work without the other, because if you just do responsible purchasing, but don't have it in your contracts, it's a lot lesser effective. And a great part of your purchasing practice is how do you do your contracts? So you cannot really separate the both from each other. I really think it's necessary to have both, to have effective contracts and purchasing practices for human rights and environmental due diligence, you have to have both. It cannot be separated. But we have clear wording requiring responsible purchasing only in the parliament text, in the council and in the commission. It is in the recitals, I think recital 30, more or less recital 30, and can of course be derived from general principles because you can say, okay, you have to look at your own contributions. And we know that a big contribution a firm has is via its purchasing practices. If they set the wrong incentives, um, that can be a contribution. And the CSDD will, in my view, in any way have to be interpreted in light of UNGP and OECD. So all these things can be derived also from the council and the commission version, especially as they both say that contracts are preventive measures in Article 7 and 8 and remedial measures, and they have to be effective because Article 3 basically says in their definition of appropriateness that all due diligence measures have to be effective. So you can come to the conclusion that responsible purchasing and contracting is part of the CSDD obligations also if it stands as the Commission and the Council have drafted it but it would be clearer in the parliament version. If you compare it just with the German situation, in Germany, the legal um, side of things of the German Supply Chain Act is pretty similar to what the commission 
and the council have said. They say use contracts, they say they have to be effective and they have to be appropriate. And so the official guidance by BAFA and help desk, the authority um, BAFA uh, in charge of um, implementing this law, collaboration in supply chain, points out many of the points that we also mentioned, no simple transfer of obligations, responsible purchasing, um, responsible exit. So I think there is indeed a big argument to be had that the CSDD has to be read, interpreted in this way as to require all these principles, but it's clearer in the parliament than in both others. And you can see how uh, there's one difference uh, I have to mention in the German Act, we have a concrete um, obligation to responsible purchasing. Those his, so this kind of, in comparison with European Commission and Council version, strengthens the point further. So it's easier to argue in the German context that this is all required. And yeah, you can read also a blog post um, for NOVA that we have recently authored on this, on the guidance by the German help desk and the BAFA on this topic. That's my take on that. Thank you so much. Moving on, how do the European module contractual clauses differ from the American module contractual clauses developed by the American Bar Association? Yeah, well, that's also a very good question because indeed, as you may know, the uh, European model clauses are kind of initially kind of a well project which has come out of the ABA uh, clauses, which kind of well, use the, the ABA model clauses as a kind of starting point. Though in the, the process of drafting the the um, EMCs, we see that it's well, kind of now gradually also departs from what the ABA has done. And there, I think we have to bear in mind that the American project was part of the business law section of the ABA. And so a lot of well, business influence and, and where, of course, there has been many kind of negotiations in terms of, on the one side, the business interest with the, the, the kind of traditional contracting practices. And on the other hand, the kind of line of thinking where we, where we kind of realize that the current practices are, are not working very well in terms of compliance with business human rights or human rights requirements. So, well, things had to change and everybody kind of saw that, but it was still a little bit of a compromise between, well, the business interests and, and the current practices and starting to move towards more responsible contracting. But I think it, it has only implemented the kind of contractual more, more responsible sourcing and contractual practices. Um, for example, there was a Schedule Q, which kind of included buyer, a responsible buyer code of conduct, where, well, kind of these contracting practices were part of that schedule, but not already implemented in the model classes. And what we have done in the European working group, which is more kind of diverse, it has people from business, from law firms, from academia. So it's, it's, it's kind of a, a broader group. And we have implemented kind of the responsible purchasing practices already in the contractual clauses themselves. So we, for example, as already explained, have departed from the model that every impact is in default. Uh, and there are several other adaptations which kind of stress the importance of real collaboration instead of risk shifting and also try to elaborate a little bit more how that contractual practices can be transposed in uh, contractual language. So there are, of course, some alignments or it is aligned, of course, with, with the kind of initial ideas of the ABA. But in terms of how the contractual clauses look like, it's, of course, a little bit different. And on top of that, of course, the ABA model was especially based on U.S. law and U.S. contract law well, has some specific features which are not common in the civil law systems in, in Europe. So those kind of things have been removed. Uh, and also we have looked into all the, or at least the, in the contractual law of the major European jurisdictions and have also analyzed whether the contractual clauses we propose are also aligned with these contract law in, in these major jurisdictions. So, for example, there's a guidance document with the EMCs, which also explains how they fit in 
for example, the contract law in Germany, and also, of course, the German Supply Chain Act. So, well, they sometimes say, well, if you use this clause, well, in Germany, you have to kind of bear in mind that you have to kind of take into account this and this and this aspect of German contract law or the, uh, the supply chain law. So there are some, I think, in, in terms of the document, which is now as a consultation draft on the internet, you see that it, to a large extent, diverges already in terms of what's exact language of the document from the ABA, though the, the starting point was kind of comparable with, with well, the elaboration in, in Europe. Also because of, of course, the much further reaching European laws well, require uh, some, some different type of, of uh, contractual language. Thank you so much. What is the experience of the German Supply Chain Due Diligence Act in relation to contractual clauses and due diligence? Thanks for the question. Well, there is really a lot now happening. No, I mean, if you have to imagine, it's a whole new world for BHR. No, in, in Germany, companies are generally taking this very seriously, all the German Supply Chain Act requirements, and are really busy now implementing, inventing new contract clauses, no procedures. It's very interesting to be here. Um, on the contract side and the purchasing practices side, I have to say that the experience is mixed. If we look at responsible contracting, I mean, yes, all the firms are changing their contracts right now and putting in human rights clauses. That's happening across all the business sectors. Are they doing it responsibly? Well, there are some, but I wouldn't say that they are in the mainstream until now. We can see some publicly uh, available interesting examples of new supplier code of conducts that partially integrate these principles. You can, for example, Google the one from S. Oliver. They are committing to shared responsibility in the first sentence, more or less, of their supply can, supplier code of conduct, obliging themselves and their suppliers to uphold human rights. Similar stuff can be seen in uh, Hapak Lloyd's new supplier code of conduct or in Flixbus supplier code of conduct. So there are interesting examples of companies overcoming the one-sidedness of these obligations and publicly also um, committing to shared responsibility and putting it in their supplier codes of conduct and thereby in their contracts. I would say it's a growing trend. Um, I would say that the mainstream is still doing it differently. But there is one very interesting development in the recent months that the BAFA and Help Desk have developed a guidance collaboration in supply chains where they really emphasize responsible use of contracts and purchasing practices. And so we believe and are also experiences uh, seeing this in our work with companies as the responsible contracting project in, in Germany, that companies are becoming more and more interested in this and they want to implement this. Sometimes they are scared because they also say, oh, but, but this is giving the supplier new rights. Now I have more risks. Do I have more risks now? And we tell them, no, we don't believe so in the end because um, yes, your supplier has new levers, so to say, and you could see this as new risks in your business relationship. But at the same time, you are building a more resilient and trustful and realistic business relationship with your supplier. And you are better equipped to meet the legal requirements under the German Supply Chain Act. Because if you read in detail this guidance, you will see things like no risk guarantees are no good idea. Don't do that. Don't just transfer your obligations to your supplier. Do responsible pricing, do responsible purchasing, look at the incentives that your termination rights set. These are all things that our clauses and our approaches, the EMCs, help to implement. So the picture is mixed, but it's getting better every day. On responsible purchasing, I have to say it's unfortunately very interesting that some companies, although I say that all the German companies, not all, but most, are taking this seriously and implementing the act. There are certain things that they like to ignore because they are uncomfortable and um, don't allow them to continue business as usual. One of those is the responsible purchasing practices. If you look to the German textile sectors, there's very encouraging examples by mainstream firms. Google, H&M, or C&A responsible purchasing policy practices. You will find nice policies out there that commit to responsible purchasing. Do the same thing in the automotive sector and you won't find a lot. I don't know why. I think because the textile sector has learned from past mistakes and the automotive sector still needs to improve. 
but it's not very encouraging for me personally to see that because I think it's very clearly written in the law. You can look it up. Section six, subsection three, number two says responsible purchasing and the automotive companies generally have a very good and mature human rights and environmental due diligence system if you look up their uh, policies. But they ignore this point. I wonder why, and I hope this will change because also automotive suppliers need money to be able to meet sustainability requirements. Thank you so much. Moving on, what is the relevance for SMEs of the MCCs? And are they able to ensure there is an effective uh, support regarding human rights and environmental due diligence obligations and a shared responsibility with suppliers, taking into account the higher bargaining power of buyers versus the supplier? Well, thank you. And I think that's that's a very relevant question indeed, because well, what we see is that these, for example, CSDD in principle only governs the larger companies. Uh, and so then you would say, so apparently smaller companies, SMEs, do not have to meet these requirements. But of course, well, this whole law will, or European law in transposed in national laws will probably have a trickle down effect uh, because, well, the larger companies have to impose this whole strategy in their supply chain. So probably also, well, will then ask their suppliers to comply and we already see that happening. So I have been informed of some examples in Poland where, for example, German companies who have to implement the German law are now saying to their suppliers, well, guys, you have to be climate neutral in 2030 and if you are not we will terminate and so you have to pay for it of course especially for smaller companies that a huge burden so that's also i think why german guidance from the bafa explains that that kind of practices are no longer allowed but we see them happening though of course we have to realize that not always buyers have as much bargaining power as, for example, in automotive or, or garment industry, uh, for example, in electronics and some other sectors, it, it, their, their leverage and their bargaining power is much less. Uh, so then it's for them also harder to impose that kind of strategies on their suppliers. Though, of course, we feel that if the supplier has the bargaining power, then it's the other way around. The supplier should not impose these kind of, at least for favorable uh, provisions for, for the supplier on the buyer, if that would kind of then hamper uh, human rights or environmental compliance. So it's, it's kind of both ways, so to say. But I think is important in terms of bearing in mind that risk shifting, cost shifting to suppliers, uh, if you have the bargaining power, is not uh, the right way to go. And I think the BAFA guidance very clearly explains that. Also specifically says, for example, that if well, companies have to, with, with their supplier, have to develop remediation plan to address certain impacts, then part of that negotiation should be the division of cost. So you should also then have a negotiation on well, the financial impact of what this remediation plan aims to do and not the current strategies supplier you have to pay. So I think that really helps. And that are kind of important things to bear in mind when negotiating with the smaller companies. And just to add on the point of the SMEs, I mean, you can see our tools also as protecting SME interests in some way. I mean, it's hard to generalize, but you can say that the kind of tools that we provide, the kind of contracts that the EMCs, that RCP provides, are more balanced and they help protect SMEs from overwhelming by the buying companies. We cannot say that SMEs are excluded from responsibilities. Of course, they have responsibilities for human rights and are a crucial part for a buying company um, also and for an SME themselves in their supply chains, ensure human rights are respected or not ensure, but um, try their best that human rights are respected. Um, and there are SMEs that are doing this very well. I mean, this is very interesting. I have a very interesting conversation with a small textile uh, uh, company some weeks ago. The name is Hakro, and it, this is also public. You can find it on the internet. And they really do good responsible purchasing with their suppliers, which is very interesting. It's a small firm, and they do take this stuff very seriously. And they say, we don't have so many suppliers. So we have a very good relationship with them, and we do our best to share the burden with them. So SMEs can do their part, but they should not be overwhelmed. And um, this is what our clauses are also about, 
because here SME protection aligns with human rights effectiveness, which I think is brilliant. Martin and Daniel, thank you so much for this episode and thank you all for listening and keeping up with the Nova Center on Business and Human Rights podcast.